Well, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity here. Um, I'm delighted. I've been at uh, ETD in uh, Uppsala many years ago and Pittsburgh, so it's great to be back and thank you because uh, I tend to be controversial and it's nice to know that uh, you want controversy, so you're going to get some today. Uh, right, okay, how many people have heard of ODF? Right, how many people know what the big UK announcement yesterday was about ODF? Right, one person. The UK, right, the UK government has mandated that all of its documents will be in ODF, open document format. That has been fought uh, bitterly by commercial companies, primarily Microsoft, and they have lost, uh, which shows that open can prevail against closed interests if you try hard enough. So I congratulate the UK government. Uh, they've kept it a bit secret and they've done brilliantly. We are in the age of open, governments are in the age of open, and universities are 20 years at least behind the curve. You are not yet picking up the spirit of the digital century. And you have to do so or you will lose your rationale uh, for the citizenry outside. Uh, theses are even further behind. Theses are something of huge value uh, which you are failing to deliver uh, to the world in general in many ways. So that's going to be the message. Okay, I have some nice things to say as well, but um, uh, we have a crisis on our hand. We have a crisis between openness and darkness, and if we do not fight for openness, we will be closed down by uh, those organisations who make large amounts of money and power out of stopping people doing things. And in the area of digital, it is extremely easy to stop people doing things, uh, and we see every day of the week uh, um, uh, initiatives from uh, telecommunications company, uh, media companies, uh, film companies, uh, publishers, uh, all sorts of companies who are trying to stop us doing things because uh, they use uh, content, digital content, as a way of making money. And my argument here is that this content belongs to the world, not to companies. And so the content that you manage uh, does not belong to you, it belongs to us. And that's, uh, uh, that's the um, uh, message I want to get across. Okay, here's my overview. Uh, so, uh, we waste about uh, 10 billion, with a B, uh, dollars each year on e-theses. We make them and then we put them away where nobody can see them. We spend that amount of money. Now, if you don't like my numbers, go to the etherpad at the bottom and type in what you think are reasonable numbers. But I did a back of the envelope cal calculation, and I think we spend $10 billion a year on funding graduate students. I'm talking here primarily about PhDs and primarily about science, uh, and uh, the product of that is a student and a thesis and possibly one or two research papers. Now, obviously, the, the student is worth a lot of money, and that's great. And I've had students, and they're wonderful, and I'm very proud of them. But the thesis is the written, uh, communicable record of what they've done, uh, and it is not being communicated. So, everybody else, as I say, is doing open. So, we have got to go into open. Now... There's a short-term solution, which is the information is out there. It's in the wrong format, uh, but we can get it out. And I'm going to show what we can do with uh, what I call content mining. And the reason I call it content mining rather than text and data mining uh, is that it's more than text. It's images, it's audio, it's video, it's everything we create. And that is open for the benefit of humanity. And I'm very happy you've given me the chance to run a workshop this afternoon where we'll be looking at uh, some of the technology. And um, I can take as many people, uh, you know, if more people want to come in, it's no problem for me, or that may be for the room. Uh, okay, what we should be doing is we should be working uh, so that we create open right from the beginning, born open. 
not just born digital, but born open. And that is what the open source community, the free and open source community do, and those methods can and should apply to research in general. Uh, and then I'm going to make the very strong thing, we do not need commercial organisations managing our digital content. And I'm sorry to say this, but I do not see a role for a company where we give our stuff to the company uh, and then we pay to get it back. We do that with scholarly publishing, it appears that we do it with theses as well, and I can see no rationale for it whatsoever. Uh, and you can challenge that, you can log on and uh, give an alternative view. We can do it now. Okay. Two months ago, a hero of open notebook science died, Jean-Claude Bradley, and last Monday I spent, uh, I organised uh, with others a memorial meeting in Cambridge for this tremendous uh, person and this tremendous vision. Jean-Claude showed that we can do science in the here and now, that everything we do can be transmitted to the world as we do it. And uh, we had a wonderful meeting, we made that point, and that is ultimately the vision that I'd like to get uh, across to you. Now, of course, you are not all involved in doing research or even managing research, but that is how research should be done, and it can be done, and there are people doing it uh, that way. So, first of all, let's see some of these numbers. You may disagree. If you disagree, put them up on the pad, tweet them, or just shout out rubbish, right? Okay? <laughs> uh, so, this is what I argue. I argue that public funding of science worldwide is about $400 billion. I'll spell that out. Four thousand million dollars. $400,000 million, there you are, an awful lot of money, uh, and most of that is not used. Uh, the outputs are knowledge in terms of papers, patents and so on, organisations, it funds, you know, um, national laboratories, it builds institutes and universities like Leicester, uh, space and atmospheric science, for example. Um, it funds people, it creates materials such as um, uh, new battery materials, new genes and things like that. But in particular, in the digital century, it creates data. And data is vastly valuable these days. Okay, here's the Human Genome Project. Uh, the Human Genome Project cost four billion, uh, and that was uh, finished just about the turn of the century, 1999. And Patel, uh, who are a well-known uh, consultancy company in the US, was asked by the US government, what was the value of the human genome? And they added up things like, what jobs had it created? What new technology had it created? What new products had it created? And they uh, decided that the value was over $700 billion. Uh, so a multiplier over that period of about 140 times. So for every dollar invested, uh, you get $140 back. Now, I have some slight uh, concerns about um, uh, their argument because there are other things that contributed to that and so on. But for every dollar put into a graduate student, you had better get more than one dollar back or it is wasted, right? So let's say that you only get two dollars back for putting one dollar into a graduate student. You're putting, whatever I said, 20 billion, 10 billion dollars. You should be getting 40 billion dollars back in value from those graduate students and much of that uh, is in their thesis. Okay, scholarly publication. Scholarly publication, uh, I imagine you all know about. Um, it, uh, we publish, uh, we, we put all this work in, we pay all this money, and then uh, we pay $7,000 to publish it. Each paper costs about $7,000. What's it cost to put on archive? Archive costs $7. 
to put a manuscript on the archive. Now, okay, you've got the refereeing and you've got various other things, uh, and Cameron Nolan from PLOS has calculated that's about 250 quid or something of that sort. So let's wrap it up and say it costs $500 to publish a scholarly paper. We're paying 10 times that. And why are we paying 10 times? Because we as academics want the glory. We are paying for glory. We are not paying for quality because the quality in technical terms of uh, scholarly publishing is among the worst document formats that I have ever seen. Um, and it's uh, a scandal. Uh, and that's the first thing we should change. But where is the rest of the value? What is added by these extra $5,000? I don't see it. We have to have a different way of doing it. Um, so, um, we have other people saying that this is wasted. Here's the Lancet uh, saying that 85% of the research is wasted because it's not communicated, it's not done properly, it's not replicated properly and so on. We've got, okay, uh, in PLOS Medicine, poor access, poor dissemination. That's because we do our research in dark corners. We do not expose it to the light of the world. Once you start exposing your work to the world, you get increased quality, increased speed, increased knowledge sharing. I'm going to show how this happens in software. But what we do is we put a graduate student in a room uh, and say, you go and do this and don't tell anybody what you're doing uh, because we couldn't care less, you know, we're, we're deeply worried that people might find out about what we're doing. Okay. What happens if you ask scientists to put data somewhere? 4%. In some disciplines, I'm a crystallographer, we have built a culture over many years uh, where people do archive their data at time of publication, but it is the exception rather than the rule. We've got the wrong model. You should not do your science and then put the data somewhere. You should be doing your science so that data is an integral part of your workflow and is it's not put anywhere, it is just part of it and available to everybody, and I'll show how to do that. Okay, so, I use the term digital enlightenment, digital century. We have to think in terms of the 21st century, and if you look outside, there is huge innovation, there is huge development, and much of it is coming from young people. I've had the privilege uh, to speak with Nelly Cruz, uh, the European Commissioner for the Digital Agenda. And she says, well, young people are wonderful. They said to her, Madam Commissioner, you are old fashioned. You have to share your data. We have to share our data. We are out of touch with uh, the youth of today. Here's the world's knowledge. DBpedia, Wikipedia. I'm talking next week to uh, Wikimania week after, I think, uh, and uh, that is one of the great knowledge creations of uh, the 21st century. I believe that Wikipedia should be the primary annotation uh, mechanism for all of science, and that's the case I will make, and I will get their support. What happens in universities when Wikipedia came out, people said, Wikipedia is rubbish, you mustn't use it, it's rubbish. That is, shows how out of what touch we are with the way that knowledge develops in a free-flowing, uh, open society. Where are, the, where are theses in Wikipedia, in DBpedia? I don't know, but I doubt that there are many theses which are available in that way, and I doubt that there are many ontologies uh, created which are shared by DBpedia. So, let's go back to e-theses. $20 billion a year, I calculate here. 200,000 science theses. I asked yesterday, somebody gave me a, uh, a figure of 25,000 theses for the UK. I multiplied it by 10. I don't know what it is. I'd like an accurate figure. Put it on the ether pad if you can. Uh, I'm taking a figure of $100,000 for a three-year PhD student averaged over the US and countries which uh, don't pay as much to students and all the rest of it. Doesn't matter. They might be out by a factor of three. It's, uh, it's a general thing. So we've got all this money. 
uh, put into this, what do we get for it? So, I mentioned the word open and free, and uh, this is a um, ethos, a philosophy which started uh, about 30 years ago, formally, particularly with uh, Richard Stallman, um, who, uh, how many people have heard of Richard Stallman? Right, okay, well, Richard Stallman uh, is uh, a somewhat unusual character. We had the privilege of having him stay in our house uh, um, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, he takes no prisoners, that everything must be free, uh, and free, uh, in his sense, is not free as in beer, but free as in speech. In other words, you can do whatever you want with it. He takes issue with the word open, um, uh, but I belong to the Open Knowledge Foundation, uh, so let's see Open Knowledge Foundation, uh, and uh, it's been we're now ten years old, and we put huge amounts of effort into making knowledge open, deciding what open is, and making knowledge useful. And it's the word useful that matters. Open by itself is not. And so government uses. Government uh, thinks open is really important for doing go government business. Governments are making um, maps open, timetables open, uh, document formats open, science open, all sorts of things. Uh, but universities are not making things open, not in the spirit of, uh, of collaboration and availability to, to everybody. Free to use, reuse, and redistribute. And I'm going to give you a little more of this preaching. Um, so here are three seminal events, uh, one per decade, roughly. Uh, we've had the Free Software Foundation, which laid the uh, bedrock of this. We've had the World Wide Web. Now, if Tim Berners-Lee had said, gosh, I want to be rich, he could have patented the World Wide Web. You can patent anything in the States, right? Uh, if you go to Texas. Uh, and um, he would have patented it. He said, you remember the 2012 Olympics? This is for everyone. The vision of Tim and people around him is tremendous. The human genome, the discoverers could have invented it, uh, could have patented it. Craig Venter tried to patent it. There was a race, and because the um, genome was done in public with no restrictions on the flow of information, the public initiative won. It was faster and it was better. And the human genome is again one of the great examples of open. But at the bottom, we see what happens when uh, we do not accept uh, and embrace this philosophy open. People die. Um, okay, so here's the Bermuda Principles. Uh, inspiring principles for sharing genome information. You are not allowed more than 24 hours, uh, uh, if you are part of the Human Genome Project, to put that up on the web. Uh, make it available to everybody. So, science is done in the open for the benefit of everybody. And here's the uh, Budapest Declaration of Open Access. It's worth reading because open access as practiced in universities and publishers is a travesty. It's not open. It's a bureaucratic nightmare. It's not open because there's no involvement of people other than university bureaucrats and publishers. Nobody else is involved in open. The authors aren't involved in it. The readers aren't involved in it. It's not open. Uh, and we will struggle over 10 years to come up with something uh, which is a mishmash, where some people can read some of it under some conditions. And that's totally against the spirit of open. Uh, the Budapest Declaration had a wonderful vision and it is such a tragedy that it has been uh, destroyed by um, infighting and by lack of vision. So it is an unprecedented public good. I'd like you to say that theses are an unprecedented public good and that in five years' time, 
all these seas will be open. There will be, okay, there will be, you know, human data, there will be um, problems with rare bird sites and things like that, but open should be the default rather than the exception. If you can commit to open theses, fully open theses, in five years' time, I will congratulate you, because that's a mission you need to take on board. So, it is an unprecedented public good. Wonderful words. It is completely free and unrestricted. And look at the people involved, scholars, teachers. How many teachers use your theses? How many teachers should use your thesis? Well, you don't know because you don't give them the chance. Students. How many students read other people's theses? You don't give them the chance. And other curious minds. And that's a phrase that I like. The world is full of curious minds. And in the digital age, it is total arrogance to assume that only universities have uh, the knowledge that we need for this century. We are facing unprecedented problems here. We are facing um, antibiotic resistance, uh, climate change, uh, and all sorts of other problems. And we need to work together uh, to solve those problems. So, look at this. You know, removing access barriers. You have to do this for theses. You share the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich. We are not making our riches available to the world and we are not interested in, uh, commun uh, in consuming uh, what is put out by uh, the global south. I'm going to Brazil next month. I'm really excited about it. And I'm going because I will learn things from Brazil, not because I have things to teach them. I will bring back the vision uh, that Brazil has got. And so a common intellectual conversation and quest for knowledge. If you can do that, uh, then we will have succeeded. You, it is not how you do it, but it is the philosophy that you adopt that is critical. Okay. So, we have, uh, uh, we have attempted to put some of these principles uh, down for subjects and in 2008 we started thinking about open data in science. Now, nobody used the term open data in uh, 2005. It's surprising. I wrote a Wikipedia entry on open data and nobody else had actually used the term at all. Uh, so. Um, we felt it was really critical that open data did not get possessed by commercial organisations in the same way as scholarly publication has. So we came up with the Panton Principles, uh, which simply more or less said, publish your data, make it open, and here's how you do it. And we did more than that. We looked at the vision of young people. Uh, so here's the Panton Arms at the top, and uh, I don't know, does this thing work? Let's try it. I don't know how to work it. Um, it was, any, anyway, this is uh, Jenny. Jenny was a student then. Uh, she was a student in Cambridge. Uh, now she's just finishing a, uh, a DPhil in Oxford, and she's coming back to Cambridge. Jenny is absolutely fantastic. She's working on malarial mosquitoes. But the point is, she is the sort of person who is changing the world. Those are the people who should... How many students are here? Right. Okay. The question answers itself. You cannot be talking about electronic theses and dissertations unless there are students here. Okay. So, uh, we applied to um, OSI, now OSF, Open Society um, Foundations, uh, for money to run fellowships for uh, curious minds, uh, people who wanted to change the world. So, here are two of our uh, our first two Panton Fellows, Ross Mounts on the left, those of you who come to the workshop will see what Ross has been doing in terms of liberating information. Ross has been doing an incredible job, not only in liberating information, but he has gone to Brussels as a graduate student and he's taken on the might of the STM publishers in terms of licenses because the publishers have tried to license uh, text and data mining. License means prevent. 
A license is there to stop you doing things rather than uh, to facilitate you. So whenever a publisher says, we have a license, it means the publisher wants to stop you doing something. Think of that. There are a few exceptions, but generally it is uh, to prevent something happening. Sophie over here is uh, just finishing her DPhil in Oxford, and Sophie has come up with the model that I would like you to take on board, which is that the people who train graduate students should be third-year graduate students. They should not be members of staff. Uh, third-year graduate un uh, students understand what data is about. They are the people who see where the future is. And Sophie has been doing a brilliant job in Oxford uh, in training the next generation uh, of graduate students. Okay, so problems, I'm not going to spend much on this because I've hinted at it already. Um, this is not me. This is the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge University. And the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge University, asked by my colleague Michel Brooke, uh, should we be spending money on Elsevier? Um, says, I regret it, they're large enough, but it is the statement down here that really matters. Elsevier is already looking at ways in which it can control open data as a private company rather than public bodies concerned. So I have no doubt that that is factually correct. He said so, I believe it in myself. The problem is, therefore, that these companies want to control it. And when I put those figures up, that we have $400 billion of research, and probably 25% of that is data, you can see why commercial companies want to control it. You can see why commercial companies want to control theses. It's very, very lucrative, and it's also very, very easy because digital control is incredibly easy. You have two mechanisms. You have the technical infrastructure, and you have lawyers. And of those, the most frightening is lawyers. So you have all seen uh, DMCA takedowns. As a community, you have to fight harder for your rights. Because if you give in, if you say, well, we don't know what this is, so we're not going to do it, uh, your rights will be gradually eroded just by practice. You will wake up and find out that although you've actually got rights, there are people already camped uh, on your land. Uh, and that's what's happening at the moment. Mendeley. How many people have heard of Mendeley? Right? Okay, think about what Mendeley is. Mendeley is now acquired by Elsevier. It's a bibliography management uh, system and social network. And it possesses, as far as I know, all the world's published information, or published uh, uh, articles, because people upload them. Have any of the other publishers squeaked about it? I don't know. But we have a company here which has all of scholarly information. It also knows who is doing what with which, so it can monitor. Uh, everybody who is using the system. Now they will tell us they don't, uh, and, the, um, uh, uh, and Google tells us they don't, and the NSA tell us they don't, until somebody comes out of those organisations and says, well actually they do. So I have no idea what goes on in um, Elsevier, uh, but I would want an independent assessment body uh, to um, regulate the practice of the management of scholarly information in any company. And I think that that is one of the things that we can demand and we should demand. David Dodd, I didn't say this, to destroy or corrupt an open science icon that threatens its business model. Okay, so what new ways have we got? Well, we've got two ways. One is short term, which is content mining. We have these theses. We have probably, I don't know, a million theses out there. I'm guessing. Um, but if we produce 250,000 a year, there must be a million out there already. Um, put it up on the pad if you've got ideas. There's masses of valuable information. I shall show that this afternoon, but I'm just going to give a very quick overview of the exciting stuff we can do. But, of course, doing things after the fact isn't the right way to do it. We're only doing it now because it's what we can do without changing people's minds. To do this properly, we have to change minds and we have to change your minds. 
so content mining is there for an immediate benefit and also to uh, uh, reorient us uh, to what the future will bring. Okay, this is how we do science at the moment. We have here a closed um, thing, which is the laboratory, right? Probably a six-person laboratory. Nobody else is allowed in it. I have colleagues where labs next to each other don't talk to each other. They find out what they're doing by reading the publications. It's appalling. Right, so you do lab work. Bits of data, you probably store it on your hard drive or um, on a CD-ROM or whatever, right? But you store it in a very inefficient way. At the end of three years, you write... A a thesis, right? You've forgotten this data, so you've got to go back and do some more stuff because you didn't do what you thought you had done and you were sure you had. And that is one of the areas where fraud and bad practice occurs. So people get to a stage where they write this lot up, they haven't got it, they're under time pressure. Well, we know it's right, so let's just Photoshop the gel. Let's just fake the spectrum. Let's just make up the analytical because we know it will come out okay. Most of it, I suspect, isn't malevolent, but it's bad and unacceptable. And then after all this, we rewrite, we publish it. Years after we've done that, so the publication is, you know, two, three years after the stuff was done, and the publications are owned in large part by other people. We can't, we as a community can't get because some intermediary whom we have paid says that you cannot get this information uh, without paying us some more money. So, content mining is now completely legal in the UK. Who has heard of the Hargreaves report? Right, well, you should all have heard of it because it is now legal in the UK since June the 1st to mine data out of any publication that you have the right uh, uh, to have access to, regardless of whether the owner says you can't or not. So if I can read the scholarly literature in Cambridge, I can mine it. And that's the law in this country. Europe is trying to move towards that. Uh, it's questionable whether fair use in the US or not covers that or, or, or whatever. But it is now the law, and you should promote that. So I, if you put restrictions on your repositories with your thesis, which many people do, I can still come in and mine that and get the facts out of it without your permission. That's the law. Now, it is for the purpose of facts, or what is called data analytics in uh, rather impenetrable language, and it's also, um, uh, uh, it's also for non-commercial use. Right. I shall not make any money out of it, but I am going to do it, uh, and I am going to mine a hundred million facts out of the scholarly literature from all the publishers, uh, and they know I'm coming, and they are throwing lobbyists into Brussels and London and uh, Washington to try and stop me doing it, but I'm going to do it, and I'm doing it because I've been, uh, and I'm going to succeed because I've been funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation and I have a growing, every day I get more people saying I want to be part of this voluntary community because we are sick of uh, the closed nature of information. So, a little bit about content mining. Don't believe that it can't be done. It used to be said, and I'm, given, I'm quoted as saying, we can't turn a PDF into XML, we can't turn a hamburger into a car. Well, we can now. Uh, I've spent two years hacking the software, and we can turn a PDF into XML. We can turn a ping into XML. Uh, and here's a diagram, that's an astrophysics uh, picture, and within one second, we can extract that diagram as it stands and turn it into a CSV file. Here's a diagram of what a machine reads from a thesis. A machine doesn't need to read the words. It can go through a chemistry thesis, and that is the logical map of the thesis, and it would take probably 10, 15 seconds to go through, uh, and most of that is struggling through reading the um, uh, PDF or whatever it is. So that's the map of the thesis. This says 
this compound was turned into that compound, this one was turned into that, and we need that and that to make that, and this one is a yellow oil, and that's a, a, a dark solid, and so forth. It picks all of that up from what it can find, and again, you'll see that uh, this afternoon. Machines love this sort of thing. Science is concerned, uh, composed of uh, numerical quantities, particularly in physical science. You've got name, value, units, and error. Those are the fundamental things of an observation. Uh, and machines can pick that up. Machines can pick up what are called named entities uh, within text. So here you can see a co chemical compound, acetaldehyde, units, places, mace head. Anyone know where mace head is? No, it's in Ireland. But, but the open geo names resolver knows where it is. So immediately the machine knows more than you. And that's not a problem, it's a benefit. Getting machines to read this enhances everything for everybody. We use natural language processing. I'm not going to show you this, but there's a formal way of understanding language developed by Chomsky, uh, and that's the cat sat on the mat, and this is a bit of chemistry. It's exactly the same. It's a tree structure, and we take that chemical structure, and we can understand all of that, and we'll be looking at that this afternoon as well. Here's a bit of chemistry. Machine can go through that in less than a second, and it mocks it up, and every bit of that, except the word and, uh, is understood uh, by this, because and doesn't mean anything here, it's just a separator. And it will, from that bit of text, it actually comes out with that molecule at the bottom, which is pretty close to magic. But that's because we've built a system that understands every chemical name that you can possibly write, so long as it's written uh, according to the standard. And we can even extract the reaction. That bit of code there, uh, of sentence, will give that reaction. And we've done 500,000 uh, patterns, and it took four days on a desktop. So we can do any thesis repository in the world in a few hours if you give us a chance. Now the problem is you don't give us a chance. I went to, I wrote to um, the University of Liège, which says it's the, uh, you know, the most acclaimed open access uh, 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 repository. I said, please, can I come and index your repository? And they said, no. Okay. So we have a problem here. Universities do not want their stuff indexed. They do not want outside people like me uh, coming in and uh, trying to help them turn it into semantic digital form. You've got to change that. Getting a few examples, we can read biology. Uh, we've got some things. Anyone know what Sternus vulgaris is? Sternus vulgaris. I'm surprised. No bird watchers. It's a starling. Okay. Uh, the machine knows that, and again, it takes less than a second. It, this is a phylogenetic tree. This is an evolutionary tree, and again, the machine can understand that in a second. And pull, it can take the whole of that diagram and pull out uh, the complete semantic structure and turn it into a XML and so on. So, that's just sticking plaster because it's not the right way to do it although it's actually very useful because it uh, enhances our appreciation of the semantics that we should be using so it is a very good way of generating ontologies uh, and semantics what we should be doing is open notebook science how many people here have used either bitbucket or github right okay they are repositories, and they are what repositories should be. Uh, and so, this is how open source software, or free and open software, uh, develops. And I will point this out again. So, here's me. I write code. Every day I write code, I commit the code back to the repository several times a day. Every time I do that, the code is validated. It tells me if I've made mistakes. It's very smart. 
There are hundreds of person years gone into creating this, probably thousands. Uh, it's called, you know, there are tools like Eclipse and so on. So, this, I do this not because of some duty to reposit it in the project. I do it because it provides me with value. You've got to get to a stage where your repositories are there because they are actually seen as valuable by the people doing the work. So, I do this. I don't start from scratch. I build on top of somebody else's code. So the code you're going to see this afternoon um, is built on top of PDF box, which comes from Apache. And because I buy into this, I say other people can reuse my code. You know, it takes a little bit first time. Oh, you're going to make the code available. People might use it. You won't know who they were. They might not thank you and so on. They have to acknowledge you. That's it. That's the rule. Um, all open source licenses are mapped pretty closely onto CC BY. Um, and there are other people using my code. And I'm delighted that they're using their code because it enhances the community. I have created a community in chemistry called the Blue Obelisk where we all use each other's code. Uh, there are 20 different groups. Uh, and the cost is $20 a year in buying them Blue Obelisks. Okay? Uh, and um, we are inspired by what other people do. We can fork. The whole thing works. And go to any software developer, and they will tell you this is wonderful. Science in universities should be like that. Repositories should be like that. You should never use the word put. You should use the word commit, because commit is part of an ongoing daily uh, validation of what you're doing. If you have this system here, you cannot have fraud. There's a complete record of everything that's done every minute of the day. You can't have invalid stuff, or if it is invalid, it'll tell you. So you don't wake up uh, three years later and find that something doesn't compile. While I'm here, there's a machine in Cambridge compiling my code every 20 minutes to make sure it still works. It's called continuous integration. I talked about graduate students. Here's Sophie Kershaw uh, in Oxford at their doctoral training centre. And what she's doing is she's training first year students in biocomputing. She's using exactly these models. And if you see here, you'll see the word modify, commit, push. And those are the terms that come out of the software repositories. Change, commit, push. All the time. And uh, what she's doing is, is rather exciting. Um, here are her students saying it's wonderful. That's Sophie at the back. Um, she wears red stilettos, she's very proud of it, she calls herself the stiletto mathematician. So. Um, and the idea here is you've got two groups, uh, and this lot does, top lot HD does cancer, the bottom lot does infectious disease modelling, and they don't talk to each other for 10 days. They work on their projects, not allowed to talk to each other. At the end of uh, 10 days, a gives their code to E, E gives their code to A, and the only thing they're allowed to look at is the documentation with the code. And the question is, can they reproduce the experiment? It's a computational experiment, so they're not worried about uh, mice dying and chemicals going off. It's only code. And that's an incredibly good discipline, because if you can do that, and other people can actually use your, uh, the whole of your experimental design, then you know you've captured the experiment. And only then. If we do that, it'll take a few years to get into the spirit, but then we will have an order of magnitude better science. So, this was, uh, the vision was picked up by Jean-Claude Bradley 10 years ago, uh, and he came up with the idea of open notebook science. It's exactly the right term, and he practiced it uh, since 2006 until his death earlier this year. Here you've got his homage to um, open source, and you'll see at the bottom, 
Normally, failed experiments are never represented in publication. Here, the failed experiments go in. They're not failed. They are experiments which didn't turn out as expected. And if you're a careful worker, they tell us something. Most chemical syntheses don't work, right? Most drugs don't work. You know, that is, uh, that, so we need to know about it. And if you only talk about the successes, then people are doomed to repeat the failures. And here, Jean-Claude is saying at the bottom, no insider information. In other words, anybody outside should be able to have a complete vision of what's going on. This has been promoted by Michael Nielsen, uh, in this groundbreaking book, Reinventing Discovery, where he comes up with the ideas of the value of community. And Tim Gowers, who's come up with the Polymath Project. Now, Tim is a Fields Medalist, which is the equivalent of a Nobel Laureate, uh, and he created a completely meritocratic community. And they're not all academic mathematicians, and they proved one of the hardest unsolved problems in mathematics, and here's one of them that they're working on at the moment, a problem in uh, complexity. Here's Jean-Claude, see this is a typical chemical experiment, uh, and that is put online as, as it happens. That's the design of the experiment, and this is uh, the record. In the notebook goes everything here. You've heard of people photoshopping gels. You can't photoshop a gel if you committed it last week into a machine that everybody can see. And here you can see, this is the record. These are hours and minutes. So every minute they record what they've done. Now, we need slightly better tools. I think we need the same, perhaps, two or three years of tool development that we had with the software repositories, the first software repositories were pretty awful, um, RCS and uh, uh, CVS. Now, uh, they're much, much better. So that evolves. We need an evolving uh, science system. Spectrum will put in it. And here, I'm actually just going to leave this. This is the last slide uh, to say that what we've got here is how we see science done in the open notebook model. The world is inside the world walls, not outside it. There is no reason why uh, somebody um, in uh, why somebody in Cape Town or somebody in uh, Bangladesh can't be part of my computational experiment. And uh, the rest of the world is the global south is actually, in some cases, doing better than us. Uh, India has an open source drug discovery program where everything is done by these methods. Matt Todd in Australia has an open source malaria uh, discovery program. Remember, research is not just for academic glory, it actually stops people dying. And on that I'll finish. Uh, thank you, Peter. I think we have some time for uh, questions uh, for Peter, and we have some microphones that will go around the room. Thank you. That's provocative as ever. Um, I want to make two points which do connect. Um, first is, if you take one line of your argument seriously, then perhaps egos should be removed. And so rather than talking about committing my code, you should just be talking about committing code. Absolutely. Because you, don't, you didn't actually create all of it, and you're gi giving it to the community, that will be modified and then it comes back. So that's one point. It's not really your code. Second point is that as a doctoral examiner, I have to make a judgment that the thesis that I am examining is the work of the person sitting in front of me. And it seems to me that there's a complete contradiction between those two points. 
That, so that if you forget about the side of, as it were, the products of science and look at the development of a human individual who is at a certain point in, the, in their career, uh, they have to be able to certify in some form that this is the work that that individual has done. This is the code that that person has written and that has contributed, that's their contribution. This is a quite different twist, as it were, view of the process of creating PhDs? Uh, well, first of all, excellent points. The first one, I do uh, frequently make the distinction between I and we, and I sometimes use I uh, exactly to pick up that point. So the word that I try and use is we. Okay. Uh, the second point is that, uh, yes, Assessing people is difficult, but if you're in an open notebook uh, situation, then you know who has committed what when. So you have a complete record of what somebody has committed to the system on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. You can't, uh, you can't be sure that they haven't got somebody sitting by their side telling them to do that, but you can't do that now anyway. You know, there are concerns... Uh, you know, when I examine a student, I wish to know that they understand the problem enough to at least convince me that it was them who did it. I think open notebook science removes most of those concerns. Well, while you're thinking up the question, this kangaroo Amy is the mascot of our software, uh, and uh, is it Ben who, invent who, who invited me? Ben? Yes. Ben, you get the Amy kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite soft. Well, if you oh, there's one at the back. Hi, Peter. It's good to see you again. Um, I've, I've been working with Lee Giles for a number of years on the very similar kinds of things. Um, just to update you a little bit, um, the union catalog that we run has 3.7 million works in it. Uh, we're happy for you to work with it as much as you'd like. Uh, by contrast, ProQuest, which is one of the groups that's represented here, and we're happy for them to be present, has about three million works from their many years of uh, involvement in this activity. Uh, so, and there are a number of people doing interesting research with content mining and classification and other kinds of things. So uh, we're glad to have you join this, and, and certainly a lot of the works in our collection are our chemistry, which requires, you know, some special processing. Uh, but the, some of the problems are a little bit more difficult in this area because we have content from everything. You know, it's every discipline, every language. Um, so we, we need your help and we hope that you can help us um, find others to contribute into this, this scene and make this work even more useful. Well, that's fantastic. Um, that's fantastic news. Um, so uh, to add on to that, you've got 3.7 million theses, not just the metadata, right? And you've got 3 million theses, and I can access all of these theses uh, without any permissions. Is that right? Can I access all yours without permission? We should talk about data mining. There was just a session about data mining ProQuest. We have no problem with you data mining in non-commercial purposes. Okay. Well, uh... Okay. Well, I will start this afternoon. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I'm going to say another controversial thing. Machines are better at classifying documents than humans. Google's shown this. So if you want to know whether something is a chemistry thesis, you ask the machine, is there any chemistry in it? You've seen the machine pick out chemistry. You don't need a human to tell you it's a chemical thesis. And of course, some of these theses contain many different disciplines. Uh, you, uh, we've got a system that does species. Uh, we can go through and pull, uh, pull out species in the same way as we can pull out chemistry. So if there is uh, a thesis which contains species and the chemistry associated with them, we've immediately got 
uh, metabolism, we've got pheromones, uh, we've got disease, we've got all sorts of disciplines which require both of those uh, at one time. Uh, Sarah Gould from the British Library. You said that universities don't want to have their theses mined. Um, I wondered what advice you would give to the British Library. We hold over 100,000 theses, so something like 40 million pages of PhD research in the ethos database. Um, being the National Library, we are careful to adhere to copyright and all um, IPR issues. Would you advise us to hand over those 40 million pages to you tomorrow and um, allow you to do as much content mining as possible from them without any regard to permissions um, or the views of the universities themselves? So, the first question is, you hold them. Are these uh, digital theses or are they um, uh, made of dead trees? I didn't hear what you said. They're, they're are they digital theses or are they um, uh, books? They're digital theses, either, okay. either born digital or scanned. So you don't hand them over to me, uh, I take a copy of them. So there's no cost involved in copying digital in the modern world. Uh, if you point me at where these things are listed, I can copy them without you having to pay anything. Now the question is, uh, what am I going to do with them? Uh, Hargreaves allows me uh, to extract facts from them without your permission. I mean, I would love your, uh, I would love your blessing, but I don't need it. Uh, I can extract the facts and I can publish them for non-commercial purposes. On that note, Peter, well, thank you very much for your uh, interesting talk. Yeah. <laughs> thank you.